discussion, though, of the Abrahamic covenant, which we started two weeks ago. Of course, none of us were here last week, so it's, it's been a couple of weeks. Um, but last week, we started looking at the Abrahamic covenant. Um, the covenant itself is initially found in, in Genesis chapter 15. Um, that's the covenant ceremony, and we looked at that a little bit. And then in Genesis chapter 17, the covenant is renewed or reaffirmed. Um, and there you receive the covenant sign of circumcision. And so last week, or two weeks ago, as we talked about the Abrahamic covenant, we said that there are two significant aspects to the covenant, the covenantal promises, and that is that of the seed or the offspring and the land. And so a lot of our time last, last time was spent talking about the seed of Abraham. And we saw that Paul identifies the seed of Abraham in Genesis chapter 3 with Christ and says that he is the seed of Abraham. We saw that through faith in Christ, we can be counted as the offspring of Abraham. And so Paul says that all those who have the faith of Abraham are sons of Abraham. We saw that in Galatians and in Romans. And so to a certain extent, we address the issue of the seed promise in the Abrahamic covenant. We also kind of tra ch chase down the issue of how, the, how Presbyterians understand or Reformed folks understand um, circumcision in the covenant with Abraham and how it connects to their understanding of baptism. That they believe that baptism replaces circumcision and so they would say that the covenant community now under the new covenant like the Abrahamic uh, covenant, includes not just believers, but also their children. And that's why they baptize infants. And we showed why we think that's not a correct understanding of the Abrahamic covenant, particularly of um, circumcision as a part of that covenant. We said that it's not baptism that replaces circumcision in the new covenant, but it's actually the new birth or regeneration. Whereas under the old covenant, um, you were a covenant member because of your physical descent from Abraham, uh, under the new covenant, you are a member of the people of God because of your spiritual birth, not your natural physical birth. And so those were some of the differences. We've said that there are continuities between the covenants of the Old Testament, uh, and we're talking about the Abrahamic covenant specifically, between the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant, but there are also some discontinuities. In other words, there are things that carry over more or less directly but then there are also some shifts and changes when you're entering the New Covenant era. We saw that with the Creation Covenant as well. We saw that, for instance, the example that I've, that I've given, I don't know, four or five times now, is that with the Creation Covenant, we are given the commandment to be fruitful and to multiply. And I said that, that remains valid for us. But also for members of the New Covenant community, there's now a new way to fulfill that command um, that's not just having children and those children having children. There's a new way under the new covenant, and that is by making disciples. We multiply. We are fruitful when we make disciples. So the command carries over, right? But there's a shift, a change, you might even say an addition when you move into the new covenant era. And we're seeing that as well with the Abrahamic covenant. That the promise of, the, of offspring or of the seed moves over. Even the covenant sign, in some sense, carries over, but there are shifts and changes. One of those shifts, one of the major differences between the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant is that under the new covenant, the people of God are a spiritual people and, and not um, a fleshly people descended literally from Abraham. That's one of the, that's one of the differences. That's one of the discontinuities. Um, so that, that deals with the seed the seed language, the offspring language of the Abrahamic covenant. The other major aspect of the Abrahamic covenant, though, is that of the land promise, which is going to be our focus tonight. But before I jump into this and start going through here so that you can fill in your blanks and feel accomplished for the night by filling them all in, let me see if there's any questions that you guys have uh, about the things that we've covered so far. What questions do you have? What things did I confuse you on? Any fan? 
Yes. There were. There's always a remnant. There always, throughout the Old Testament period, there's always a remnant. In other words, there are those who are born again in the Old Covenant community. The difference is everyone who's, who's a part, who's, you know, not just Abraham's son, because, of course, you have Ishmael, but um, in, that, in that family line, in, among the people of Israel, all those physical descendants are part of the covenant community, but not all of them are saved. In fact, the vast majority of Israel under the old covenant were lost. That's something we'll talk about more when we talk about the covenant with Moses. But the vast majority were not spiritual descendants, but it is important to note that there were some. There's always some. Yeah, that's a good point. Any, anything else you guys want to talk about or clarify? It's been two weeks, so maybe not. <laughs> okay, then let's jump into this issue of the land. And I'll say this, that, that when we talk about the land, it can be a contentious issue. There have been different opinions over the fulfillment of the land promises. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to argue for my approach. I will summarize the other, other views but I'm going to argue for my approach to the land promises. And, uh, and if you disagree with me, that's okay. All right? But I have to present to you what I think is the most um, biblically consistent approach to the land promise. So let's jump in here. You cannot obviously talk about the Abrahamic covenant without talking about the land of promise. Because for one thing, how you think about or how you understand the promise of the promised land it impacts and determines to some degree, not completely, but it has an impact on your expectations for the future or for end times. You have to ask questions like, will God give ethnic Israel the land of promise sometime in the future? Is that what we should be looking for? Should we be looking into the future for a time when ethnic Israel receives the promised land as a nation? Or, you know, or do the promises of Abraham await a literal fulfillment? So many people look, and for instance, we'll talk about this in a little bit, look to the thousand years of Revelation chapter 20, often called the millennium, as the time of the fulfillment of those promises. That's one approach to the promised land. Or have the promises, in some sense, already been fulfilled during the Old Testament era? Or, here's a third view, perhaps... Fulfillment still lies in the future, but in a less literal manner. So there's three kind of approaches that I'm outlining here at the very beginning. One is um, a literal fulfillment of the land promises, fairly precise with the borders mentioned, which we'll look at in a little bit, in the future for ethnic Israel, national Israel, during the thousand years called the millennium. That's one view. Another view says, no, 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 they were all, those promises have already been fulfilled. At some point in Israel's history, they occupied all the land, so promises fulfilled. And then the third view, no, the promises haven't really been fulfilled. They're still in the future, but it's not literal. It's not ethnic Israel. It's a more spiritual um, fulfillment. So, so those are the three views. But before we really grapple with those, I want to talk a little bit about something that I think gets missed a lot in this discussion. And that is the concept of the land, okay, the concept of the land in Genesis before the covenant with Abraham. It's not as if the word land pops up out of nowhere when you get to Genesis chapter 12 and Abraham is introduced to us. No. The word land occurs many times in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And we need to understand what's happening when land is used in the first 11 chapters. Now, we miss it a lot of times because in many of these cases, it's not, the word is not translated as land. It's translated differently. So let's talk about that a little bit. All right. In order for us to understand what's meant by the promise of land and the covenant with Abraham and how that promise might be fulfilled, first you've got to understand what Moses means and how Moses talks about the land before Abraham arrives on the scene. I can't go into a ton of detail, but we'll talk about a couple places in these, in these first several chapters of Genesis. First, we'll talk about the, the word land in Genesis chapter 1. 
You may not realize that the word land is prominent in Genesis chapter 1 because it's not usually translated that way. It's translated as earth in almost all of our English translations in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, for instance, verse 1, we read this. This is kind of a literal translation I'm giving you. In the beginning, God created the sky and the land. That's a more literal sort of translation. Nearly all scholars look at that phrase and say, well, that's a special term that is a way of referring to all of creation. So whenever you put sky and land or heavens and earth together, together that phrase refers to the whole of creation. So in Genesis 1-1, there's no specific piece of land that's in mind. It's just used in combination with the word sky or heaven to refer to all of creation. But when you keep reading through Genesis, we also see this word land pop up several times. Okay, And each time that it's used, there's no specific piece of land that's in mind. It's used 17 times. The word land, same word that we find in the Abrahamic covenant. 17 times in Genesis chapter 1. But it doesn't refer to what we normally mean by the word earth. That is... It's not a reference to the globe, right? When you read through Genesis chapter 1 and you see the word earth over and over, at least for me, maybe not for you, the picture that usually comes in mind is a globe, like the whole world, right? That, that's what I usually think of. But instead, that's not what it refers to. What it refers to is actual land or earth with a small e. And you can see that, for instance, Genesis 1.28. There where the, the earth is distinguished from the sky and from the sea. It says, God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful, or to Adam, be fruitful and multiply and fill the land or the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens or the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the land, the earth. So it's clear there that Earth, or land, is distinct from the sky and from the sea, right? Because you have creatures in the sky, creatures in the sea, creatures on the land or on the earth. So in Genesis chapter 1, the word land refers to all the dry ground that God has created. That's what it refers to. And it's over this dry ground, all of it, that man is to exercise dominion, it's the land or the earth that he's supposed to fill and subdue. So already we're seeing some connections between the story of Abraham and the story of the first man, Adam, in Genesis 1 and 2. Just as Abraham was promised land and numerous descendants to fill that land, so Adam was given all the land or all the earth and he was commanded to fill it with his descendants. So here's a, a quotation from one Old Testament scholar who says this, that from the beginning of the creation account, God's interest in the land lies at center stage. That's what I was saying earlier. Land is not a theme that enters into the story with Genesis 12 or 13. Land is a theme from the very beginning. From the beginning of the creation account, God's interest in the land lies at center stage. After establishing the larger point that God created the universe, Genesis 1-1, the writer turns immediately to give an account of God's preparation of the land. Thus, it is the remainder of the creation account that it is that the remainder of the creation account is devoted to the narrative record of God's preparation of the land. So Genesis 1 is about God's preparing the land or the earth for man to dwell upon. The creation account is told from that perspective in Genesis chapter 1. So that the high point of the creation story is the creation of man on day 6. And all the previous days are the preparation of the land so that man can dwell on it and fulfill the mandate that God has given to him. That's really important to understand as Genesis 1 moves forward, that the land is a significant, significant theme. 
And then if we move forward in the story, we'll jump past the genealogies. We'll move forward in the story to the flood. And I say here that it's striking to realize that after the creation account, the land is not central. In other words, it's not mentioned in those genealogies very often. It's not really mentioned there. It's not central until the story of the flood. In Genesis 6, 5, and 6, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, in the land, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, on the land, and it grieved him to his heart. Now the earth, or the land, was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth, or the land, was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, or the land. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth, the land, is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Down a little more. Behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the land to destroy all flesh which is in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the land shall die. So just like Genesis chapter 1, all the occurrences of earth or land in Genesis 6 refer to all the dry land in the world. That's really important. The word land in Genesis 1 and the word land in Genesis 6 through 9 refers to all the dry ground in the world. All the area over which Adam and his descendants were to exercise dominion. The flood is actually described, we saw this, as judgment upon the land and bringing rain upon the land. It's not like God just targets human beings in the flood. It's all the land, right? So there is this kind of connection between mankind and the land upon which man is to live and over which man is to rule. When you move ahead to Genesis 9, you see the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, fill the land, is repeated to Noah and his sons two times. In Genesis 9, verse 1, and then again in verse 7, when the creation covenant is renewed. So here's the point. This is really important. This is why I'm going into all this background. There is a connection between God's blessing and presence in the land and His judgment upon man and rejection from the land. There's a connection. There's a pattern that begins with creation when Adam and Eve were ejected from the garden. The same thing happens later in the Old Testament when Israel breaks covenant. So leading up to Genesis chapter 12, where God initiates the relationship with Abram, leading up to that, the word land in Genesis refers to all the dry ground in the world, and that's the area, that's the dominion that Adam and his descendants are to rule over. And whenever God judges man, that judgment affects man's relationship with the earth. In the flood, all the land is affected by God's judgment. In the garden, Adam is kicked out of the garden, but also the ground itself is cursed. So that's, there's a connection there that we should have in our minds if you were just reading Genesis and trying to pick up on things, trying to make connections, there'd be some sort of connection in your mind between this word land, between the whole world, and man's connection to it. So that's not new when we get to Abraham. All right, so that's the first thing that I would just want to make sure we understand. Second thing I want to talk about is the, the borders of the promised land. In the covenant ceremony in Genesis 15, God promises to give to Abraham's descendants this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, 
the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. All the ites, right? The promised land ranges in Genesis 15 from Egypt or for what, from what's called the River of Egypt to the Euphrates River on which both Babylon and Assyria, where Babylon and Assyria would both be later founded. Really Assyria before Babylon. But both of those nations would be founded upon the Euphrates River. So the land from one great kingdom, Assyria, Babylon, to the, toward the north, to another, Egypt in the south, everything in between those areas would belong to Abraham's seed. There are other places where the borders of the promised land are mentioned in Scripture. And I've got them here. won't read through all of them just for time's sake. I put some of them on here on page 62 and 63. Um... But they are somewhat variable in their descriptions of the exact boundaries of the promised land. Uh, so if you guys want to look up on the screen, I know on page 62, some of you might have a picture that looks like this. And others of you might have something that looks like nothing because the printer was doing weird things. So a few of you might have a decent map. But for those who don't, the same map is up here. The yellow circle there is roughly, okay, the borders of the promised land. Down in the south, just at the edge of the yellow oval, you can see a little body of water on the left-hand side. That is probably what the author has in mind when he speaks of the river of Egypt. Now, most of us would immediately think the Nile River, right? Right? Um, but the Nile River is not normally referred to as the River of Egypt, but this small little, it's oftentimes, it's dry today. It's a dry sort of riverbed, creek bed today. Um, but it was often filled with water then, not always, seasonally. But it was known often as the River of Egypt because it established the easternmost boundary of Egypt throughout most of Egypt's history. In other words, so that's where the border of Egypt is, if that makes sense to you. The river of Egypt is not the Nile River, I don't think. But it's this border body of water, often called the river of Egypt. There are not different words in Hebrew for river or creek or stream. The way that we have in English, it's the same word for all of them. So a river can be a larger body of water like the Nile. Or it can be more of a creek or a stream that sometimes has water and sometimes doesn't. So most Old Testament scholars think that the river of Egypt is that body of water, not the Nile River. Of course, we know the Euphrates River in the north. That's not difficult to identify. Um, the Euphrates River is right up there, and it winds its way down, um, down through, when it gets down close to the bottom of uh, where it get, you know, we, can you see where the two rivers, the Euphrates River, the other big river system is the Tigris. Can you see where they almost come together? Kind of in the middle? That would be central, that would be um, Babylon, central Babylon. And Babel would have been near the, that, where they almost come together. And Assyria, the kingdom of Assyria was located more northerly, um, but of course, they went back and forth, Assyria and Babylon. Sometimes one controlled all the territory, sometimes another, until the Persians came along and took it all. Um, but Assyria originates a little more northerly and is more associated with the Euphrates River generally. So, so between these two great kingdoms, you have the land of promise between these two kingdoms. Okay, so in general, we can say that the promised land included all the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea and from Egypt to the Euphrates River or, in some descriptions, from the Red Sea to the Euphrates River. So that area in my oval up there roughly is or the borders of the promised land. In the, 
Typically, when the, in the Old Testament, when they refer to going to the Euphrates, they mean that northern section of the Euphrates, particularly when they use it as a border description. Um, they did not think of it as an eastern border. They thought of it as a northern border, interestingly enough, just because it's situated in the north. From their perspective, it's up north. So this is the important point. In the ancient world, this land, the promised land, was a pivot point for all travel and trade. So you're, you're at the center, right? You've got three continents that are coming together here. This is, for all intents and purposes, the center of the world. Particularly from the perspective of someone who lived in the ancient Near East. This is the center of the world. All the three continents come together. And yes, there are peoples, people groups um, in the Americas um, and, in many, and in many islands and even Australia, probably even at this time. But all of those people groups can be traced back to, one, to these continents, either Africa or Asia, really. Um, so this really and truly is the center of the world. And all trade had to pass through even if you were moving from Asia into Europe, you would pass through that little northern portion of the promised land because that's where the trade routes ran. You've got too many mountains toward the north of there, right? You're not going to go through that rough terrain. All that stuff in the middle where the mouse is pointing, where the arrow is, that's all desert. You can't travel through there. So you've got to go through the promised land. So within the context of the Torah, this land, the promised land, represents all the land. The relationship of Abraham's descendants to the promised land mirrors the relationship between Adam's descendants and the whole earth. So it makes sense that God would give Abraham a land in which his descendants would come into contact with the whole known world and every major kingdom or empire within it. The promised land was centrally situated to allow Abraham's family to become a blessing to all the other families of the nations. And in that way, Abraham might come to inherit the whole earth for all the land. I'm arguing that within the context of Genesis, the promised land represents all the dry land of Genesis 1. It is a selected, representative, central piece that represents all of it. That's what I'm arguing, in case you missed it. Okay, any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't have a long stick to point at things, but yes, yeah, so... Um, over here, top left hand is Turkey. Down here, where you see this cluster of rivers right here, <laughs> that's the Nile, the Delta. Okay. Over there where the arrow is, is desert. Over here, this area is Babylon, or modern day Iraq and Iran. The, I don't know exactly where the border between Iraq and Iran is, but it's right around there. I know ancient maps. <laughs> Ask me about modern <laughs> countries. Yes. Yeah. So you're getting the edge of Greece on the far top left-hand side. You're getting the edge of Greece, which today is ancient Greece. Most of ancient Greece is within Turkey today. So you're getting the edge of even modern Greece there. Does that help? Oh, okay. That's a great question. Sometimes I forget. Okay. Any other questions so far? Okay. So let's talk about Israel in the land. So let's move forward through history, through the Old Testament. Move, we're going to move. We're going to push all the way past Abraham, past the Exodus, to the time of the conquest when Joshua led the people into the Promised Land. 
So God did eventually bring Abraham's descendants into the promised land after their slavery in Egypt. The book of Joshua tells us the story of the conquest of the land by Israel. And there's a summary that we read. Joshua 21, 43. Thus, the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they settled there. Well, that seems like open and shut case. They got all the land, right? That's what it seems like. But you've got to read all of Joshua, okay? We don't want to be too quick to assume that this was the complete fulfillment of the land promise to Abraham. Um, there's really a couple of reasons for that. First of all, Joshua's armies did not conquer all of the nations living in the land of Canaan. They may have spread out. The Israelites may have spread out throughout the land, but they did not conquer all the nations living in the land of Canaan. We know that from Joshua 13. We read this, Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years. And there remains yet very much land to possess. So at the end of Joshua's life, there still remains very much land to possess. So Israel invaded all of the land, and they did spread out throughout Canaan, but some of the kings and cities remained undefeated. In fact, there are in Joshua lists of kings that were not defeated by the Israelites. So possession of the land under Joshua did not quite measure up to Israel's, and more importantly, any reader of the Bible that's just reading the story, it didn't, doesn't measure up to their expectations. What if we push a little further, though? Under Solomon's reign, Israel did come to rule over all of the territory promised to Abraham. So if you look up here, this is a different map because the one that I put in here was not of high enough quality to pro project that large. But it shows you the same basic things. They're just different colors. Okay? So here we see um, between the green and the purple, these are all the areas that Solomon ruled over. Okay? Now, the tribes of Israel did not occupy all of these areas. The boundaries of the tribes, interestingly enough, when you add them up, are smaller than the boundaries of the promised land. So the tribes are kind of centrally located between the... Dead Sea, the, the body of water on the, on the bottom there, and the little tiny body of water up there, that's the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River runs between them. Um, all the tribes of Israel are right there. But the borders of the Promised Land are actually significantly larger than that. And um, during Solomon's reign, his rule extended from the Euphrates River down to the border of Egypt. So under Solomon, actually, the literal boundaries of the land were possessed by Israel and ruled over by one of Israel's kings. However, that rule or the extent of that rule did not endure beyond Solomon's lifetime. But as soon as Solomon dies, the nation is fractured. They lose their hold over these lands in the north. And those lands come to be ruled over local kings again, and then eventually Assyria takes over. Um, Moab and Edom rebel and are no longer under the rule of um, Davidic kings anymore. I mean, it, it really is very, it's a very short measure just in decades, in, um, a period of time in which Israel did rule over all of the promised land. And that's a problem when you're talking about the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. That's a problem because in Genesis 17 and 8, God told Abraham that he would give him the land as an everlasting possession, right? Not to hold on to for a few years. So it is difficult to say that the, the promise of the land given to Abraham is entirely fulfilled under the old during the Old Testament. It's hard to make that argument. Many make that argument, but I find it difficult to accept entirely because of the language of the Abrahamic covenant. But you can understand why some people would go, I mean, it's pretty exact, right? Yes, the territory is exact, but the time frame is not, not right. So God's people are promised that they would live in the land forever, but the Old Testament tells us the story 
of Israel's gradual and eventual catastrophic loss of the land. Eventually, God sent Babylon to destroy Jerusalem, take the people captive because of their disobedience. So eventually they lose it all. Under Solomon, they, they lose these purple areas. But eventually, you know, after Solomon, after he dies, they lose the purple areas there. But the next couple hundred years, or really, or a few hundred years, are the story of just loss, bit by bit of the land, until Babylon comes and they lose all of it. So even though the people of Israel later returned to the land, they did, They were in captivity, they were in exile for 70 years, and then they were allowed to return. Even though they returned to the land, they never again gained gained all the promised land. They never got it back. And they never fully escaped the rule of foreign nations. There's a short period of time between the Old and New Testaments. You can read about it in the books of 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 Maccabees, 1 Maccabees in which there is a revolt against foreign rule and a, and a Jewish king is installed, but it doesn't last long and it's a small, tiny little kingdom. Okay, Important historical event, but in terms of the stuff we're talking about, not significant at all. They never really escaped the rule of foreign nations. So that rather than living in the land so that they might become a blessing to all nations, they lived in part of the land under the thumb of the nations. And the Old Testament ends with the hope that the promises made to Abraham and to David later on might one day be fulfilled in their entirety. So, we're going to have to stop there because it's 727 and there's no way for me to finish. We've got another at least 30 minutes of material. So, we'll finish, th- we'll finish these handouts next week. But look over them. Um, Try to understand the three different views that I outlined at the beginning. And then kind of look over those borders. You can even look up some other maps online, maybe zoom out on Google Earth or something to see how it compares. Get a good mental image in your mind of the things that we're talking about. And next week, we'll come back and we'll cover this section called Fulfillment and the other sections and I will, I will try to make a case for my understanding for which of those three views I adopt, um, which one I think is correct. I'll try to make a case for that. And you guys will be free to ask questions um, and, and, and push back even if you want to. That's fine. I don't mind. Okay? All right. Let me uh, close this in prayer, and then I'll free you. <laughs> Father, I am grateful that we're able to come back together after a week off. And after so many of us being out traveling and doing different things, grateful to be back together tonight, looking into your word, trying to understand your word, um, and coming to value and appreciate uh, who you are as a covenant-keeping God. That all of our hope is rooted in the fact that you are faithful to all of your promises, and that all of your promises are yes in Christ. And even when we're struggling, even when we, it looks to us as if some of your promises are not being fulfilled, we trust and we know that sometimes the fulfillment awaits a later time. And sometimes, sometimes the fulfillment of the promises doesn't look the way that we expected We're seeing that as we study these covenants and the promises that come along with them, and I pray that you would help us to apply that truth to our own lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you...